Bio Networks for the Brain Research and Information Technology Communities. Orion Bio Networks is a nonprofit research alliance whose mission is to accelerate time to cure for brain diseases through the power of shared data and predictive analytics. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me walk through some logistics. This program is being recorded and will be archived in the Orion Bio Networks YouTube channel and website. The presentation will be approximately a half hour in length to allow 15 minutes of Q&A. Please use the Q&A button to post a question at the end of the session. If you are having difficulty viewing the screen, viewing the full screen, please try to toggle to fit to screen. Today, our speaker is Dr. Boris Hyatt, who I've had the unique privilege of working with these past two years as part of the Orion Alliance on a multiple sclerosis biomodel project. Dr. Boris joined GNS Healthcare seven years ago as Senior Director of Genomic Medicine, where he leads a scientific team focusing on systems biology and related areas. Dr. Ayat has more than a decade of experience in network inference and systems modeling, and he has even authored a popular network inference algorithm. He earned his PhD in bioinformatics from Boston University and his bachelor's degree and master's degree in computer science with a focus on machine learning and natural language processing from the Johns Hopkins University. In his spare time, Boris also competes in Olympic weightlifting beating out the strongest of Russian contenders. In this webinar, Dr. Hyatt will present a unique Bayesian causal inference modeling platform called REFS, developed by the GNS Healthcare team and applied, uh, had applied modeling an MS cohort uh, from our Ryan Bio Networks 1.0 initiative. Boris, I now turn it over to you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Magali. Can everyone hear me all right? Um, well, I, I am um, afraid that the next time you'll probably match me up for Mortal Kombat with the Mountain from uh, Westeros. That probably won't end so well. At least it's weightlifting this time. Um, so without further ado, um, let's go into this presentation and discuss the work that we have done as part of the Orion Consortium which I will momentarily share my screen. Okay. So as part of this collaboration, uh, we have um, built a model of uh, multiple sclerosis that I'll discuss, and in particular, I'll, I'll discuss model one. This is still, to some extent, an ongoing effort, and we're building a new model. Um, so meantime, we'll talk about the one that we have built. Um, so this uh, collaboration focused on unmet needs in multiple sclerosis. In particular, what is the structure of patient population? Are there different subsets of uh, MS? Can we use that to individualize treatment? Is there anything we can say about uh, causes of neurodegeneration or possibly find targets for drug development? The data from, for this study came from the CLIMB study data set, which uh, is a longitudinal study over a number of years that had enrolled over 2,000 patients. And uh, in addition to the clinical measures, the study looked at genetics, imaging, um, and some gene expression samples. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the uh, um, study data had to be adapted for use with our um, causal inference engine, about which I'll talk briefly. And so I'll start with the composition of the data frame. First of all, there are the disease measures, and in particular, the, there is a gold standard of diagnosis in MS, which is expanded disability status scale uh, due to Dr. Kurtzke, that he published in 1983. And the scale goes from zero, which is completely normal, to 10, which is dead. Um, and the intermediate disease stages are roughly between two and a half and seven, where you get some disability, but the patients are not bed confined yet. 
In addition to this summary scale, which uh, is frequently used uh, even in the context of self-evaluation, has been shown that it can be reliably self-evaluated by patients, there is a more refined scale that Dr. Kursky had proposed much earlier in the 50s, if memory serves. Um, that scale fo uh, followed the different functional areas uh, of MS. Uh, so, for instance, uh, pyramidal, cerebellar, brainstem, and so on. Um, so these are the functional systems that MS affects. And uh, Dr. Kursky had published a, an algorithm for converting the functional scale scores to DSS for mild to moderate impairment, which is actually the, exactly the study population. So there is a relatively close relationship. This is a single system designed by the same researcher, and the main purpose and difference of EDSS is uh, the ease of repeatability so that a patient can self-evaluate or a nurse can do it. So it doesn't have to be necessarily um, a CNS specialist doing the evaluation every time. So uh, this is the composition of the data. What you see in the first line, um, first of all, there were two models, with RNA and without RNA, and you'll see momentarily why. Um, what you see in the first line is the sample counts and the different data sets. And then as the data set is composed by bringing together different subsets of data, there will be a certain loss of power um, just because certain patients were profiled in one data set but not the other, and as a result, patient population is decreased. So let's look at the model with RNA in particular. Um, 1,108 patients started out having genetic information, and 363 had gene expression information. Unfortunately, they were not a proper subset of the people with genetic data. So once you bring them together, that only leaves 232 with genetic and genomic data. Um, furthermore, there was some loss due to absence of certain clinical records. So um, once you put together this data set, depending on which scale you look at, you can see on the bottom uh, left, if you use Kursky scale, you get 99 patients, and if you use EDSS as the outcome measure, you have 104 patients who had the complete data. Without RNA, as you could see, RNA was a significant bottleneck in composing the data frame. Without RNA, the counts are a little better, and skipping all the way to the bottom, you can see that um, with Kursky scale, there were 238 patients, whereas with EDSS, there were 244. So let's talk about data frame composition in more detail. The genetic pipeline was actually composed of two different um, SNF chips um, data, which were imputed to 1,000 genome project data. Um, so this process of imputation, partially because these data came from different platforms, resulted in a lot of artifacts. And after we performed significant filtering and the LD block uh, pruning, it turned out that we came down to about 103,000 SNPs, which was actually similar to the overlap uh, between the two platforms to begin with, once you prune the LD block out. So that was the uh, SNP processing pipeline at a glance. The gene expression pipeline, um, gene expression was uh, a set of um, AFI arrays that were normalized using Plier 16. Uh, sibling probe sets were removed. Uh, we performed variable selection using INI, which filters for informative genes, the ones that actually change in this patient population. And that brings it down to uh, roughly 3,300 uh, probe sets of interest. The clinical variables were composed of three different types, demographic, clinical criteria, and then clinical rate variables. And we'll go through those in a little more detail. Uh, the demographic variables were things like gender, uh, marital um, status, autoimmune, family MS history, uh, autoimmune history, smoking, um, symptoms and diagnosis age, and then interestingly also latitude, which uh, for birth and childhood, which actually both have bearing on uh, MS incidence rates. Um, so this data was processed in um, a relatively standard way for continuous variables log transformed or where log was inappropriate due to negative value or to zeros rather we performed a through transform 
um, latitude was um, inverse uh, cosine transformed to estimate insulation, which is actually the uh, mechanism of uh, a latitude driving a mass incidence. Um, we didn't transform time, and then the missing variables were imputed, imputed using the R package MI with different imputation methods for different variable types. Clinical criteria, um, which are basically diagnosis criteria, um, we didn't need to process those, they're basically binary variables. Uh, clinical rate variables, these are the um, rate of change of the different endpoints. So here I should explain that we decided to focus on the rate of disease progression, which is a very interesting question. Um, rather than, uh, let's say, disease at a certain time, because patients were measured at different times, followed for different lengths of time, and so on. Um, so for uh, what you're seeing in the chart on the bottom left is a DSS for a particular patient um, across different visit dates. And in this particular case, you'll see that it's very um, nice and even, and you'll see that the disease stays kind of even for a while and then gets worse. Occasionally it gets better. But basically there is a very clear trend. And so um, that's uh, what we modeled. We basically took the slopes of these fits and modeled those. So the rate of progression of the various EDSS or Kersky scale variables. The MRI data that was collected. Um, we had to do significant processing for the MRI data set. Um, this had to do with a couple of different things. First of all, um, across time, different magnet strengths were used. Uh, second, there were different segmentation algorithms and uh, uh, annotation calls you know, for whether or not segmentation was correct automatically used across time. So you'll see the three most common calls highlighted with different colors in these uh, time courses for different patients. And the black triangle points out another interesting thing with respect to these data sets, which is uh, when gene expression data was collected for these patients. So gene expression data was collected in a single batch, and uh, it was um, collected in a sense opportunistically. It was not possible to plan it in advance. So as a result, not all patients had it, as I've mentioned before, and also the collection time was to some extent uh, arbitrary with respect to the patient's time course, which is nicely illustrated here. So um, we'll return to this when we talk about uh, time to event and other uh, types of analysis that we did. So um, with uh, MRI, so we basically needed to match expression uh, data to these data sets, which uh, was helped by the fact that we were looking at rates rather than specific dates. For MRI data, um, we had to do a bunch of normalizations. Uh, for lesion volume, we had to normalize it by intracranial cavity volume. Um, we had to adjust for the difference in MRI uh, status codes. These are the uh, segmentation algorithms. Um, and then we had to, to get a single point for the offset of MRI to match the SNP data. So that was one place, or rather, I'm sorry, the expression data. Um, so that was the point, that black triangle on the previous slide. So that was the point which we used for the offset to model along with the slope for the MRI rate of change. And so those are uh, the MRI rate of change and the uh, baseline value. You remember baseline is the expression data collection time point. Um, those were the two values kept in the model. So I've mentioned that we had to normalize um, the uh, lesion volume to intracranial volume. Some variables were already normalized. Um, for instance, uh, brain parenchymal fraction was normalized as part of standard processing of measuring it. Um, without normalization, lesion volume actually showed very strong gender differences um, at the same functional disability, basically. So that was not um, a good thing and a clear indication that further processing needed to be done. 
And the intuition here, by the way, was that uh, the lesion volume and how much it affected uh, brain function related to the size of the functional areas, which in turn should be related to intracranial cavity size. So without going into too much detail, we performed linear, linear mixed effect uh, modeling to accomplish all of these tasks, such as um, dealing with different status codes, um, interpolating the uh, MRI value at a particular date, and extracting the MRI slopes. Once we combined all of these data sets into a single data frame, we pursued the following modeling strategy. Um, at the baseline of the causal model that we were building, and we'll go into how we build causal models shortly, uh, but at the uh, baseline, at the topmost layer were the SNPs, the drivers of uh, pretty much everything else, causally speaking. So the genetic variability in the study was uh, thought to be causative to everything. Um, clinical variables uh, could drive uh, genetic variability or in turn could be driven by genetic variability. That would be the endpoints in the left corner clinical rate. Uh, the MRI variables could also drive clinical or be driven by them. And where it says genes, you should read gene expression. I apologize for the typo on the slide. And so gene expression could also drive MRI. And in the end, there's, there was the final model, which is the survival model, time to event, time to the next relapse from the point gene expression was collected. That was actually modeled outside the platform, which is indicated by the dotted line. So once we composed the data sets, and I, as I mentioned, we built a model without RNA and with RNA. Uh, we had a number of choices to make, in particular with respect to the endpoint. And for a variety of reasons, we have chosen to go with the Kurtzky scale rather than a DSS, partly because it's a richer data set um, in terms of functional aspects, and partly because um, we saw some evidence for more signal in uh, the Kurtzky scale, uh, scale domain, the functional scale. So this slide basically shows the same thing. And the final selection of models were models 1.1 and model 1.2, with and without RNA. Those are the models we'll be discussing today. So 1.1 is referred to here as model 1. And model 2 is the model that I've just called model 1.2. And they had, respectively, 99 and 238 patients. And both models explored uh, both the additive effects of SNPs and uh, also uh, interactions of SNPs with uh, gene expression, so epigenetics as well. OK, so then let's talk about how we use um, these types of data sets to build data frames the REFS models. First of all, I should mention that REFS stands for Reverse Engineering and Forward Simulations. That's the uh, GNS causal modeling engine. And I will uh, walk you through how it works. So um, a simplified version of what we do is we look at different models driving particular pieces of the data set. So for instance, let's you know, here the engine is exploring different ways of predicting gene expression using clinical, patient data, and so on. And uh, these little models, these little predictors are built for every variable that can be an outcome variable, including the phenotypes that the study is modeling. So it's just an assembly of little piecewise models. And then these fragments, as we call them, are put together by uh, a process of Monte Carlo sampling, or you can think of it as optimization, to build a single network. And that network um, then captures the, um, the, the data set in a parsimonious way to explain how this data might have been generated. Of course, no single network is going to be accurate. It's um, too big a search space. It's, even if there was a perfect answer, it would be probably impossible to find it. And in addition, most data sets, if not all, don't really capture all the information relevant to the biological problem. So we expect some uncertainty in the um, network that we're building. 
So we can capture that by building multiple networks, in this case 256. And they can be slightly different, but then they will also be substantially the same. Um, and if there are groups of networks, that might actually give us some insight into um, subgroups of disease, let's say. So how do we investigate these models once they're built? So the model is really a collection of networks. That's shown in the middle of the slide. Um, and then if we, what happens uh, if we were to knock down a particular gene, let's say gene A, in a 65-year-old uh, male? Uh, how would that uh, affect lesion volume? This is a hypothetical example. So uh, the way we would do it is we would set uh, gene A to its baseline and generate uh, some data for lesion volume. And then we would uh, knock down gene A and generate more data shown in red. And then looking at these two data sets for lesion volume, we can ask whether, it's actually, sorry, this is showing more detail. So these data are generated from individual networks. And you can see how each network generates a new cell, and so on until we have a prediction from every network. And in fact, we actually generate multiple predictions from every network. And then we can assess whether these predictions are significantly different from each other. And based uh, on the uncertainty in the outcomes under the two different conditions, we can determine how different they are and what type of powering would be necessary or, or rather available at a given sample size or what sample size would be needed to achieve certain power if we were to uh, validate this study with a new data set. So here's another example of how we can investigate this. If we have a model which has some uh, gene expression transcripts and endpoints, so we can perturb individual transcripts and measure endpoint responses. And once we do that, we can build a functional network. These are not necessarily direct relationships. These are functional relationships that will capture different features of the network. Transcriptional modules, feedback loops, directed paths or hubs. So a single network cannot capture some of these features, in particular, let's say, loops. Okay, so let's talk about the models that we've actually built for this multiple sclerosis study. As a reminder, we built two using um, the transcription data and not using it. Both models focused on the rate of change of different aspects of Kurtzky functional scale, and both looked at uh, epigenetics in addition to, in, by epigenetics in this case, I mean the gene by, SNP, by expression interactions, uh, in addition to direct uh, contribution of genetics. And the two sample sizes were 99 and 238 patients. So this is a slide from a paper by our collaborators. Um, Autobahni et al., where they looked at just the expression data from uh, the entirety of 300 and so patients for whom they collected expression. So they did not look at the other data sets in conjunction with the expression data, but then the flip side, they had a larger sample size. And they identified two expression subtypes, one of which had a high expression of CD28 signaling pathway, B cell receptor signaling, and IL2 signaling and the other had the interferon pathway and pattern recognition receptors. And that's the paper came out in 2012. What uh, we looked at, as I said before, is uh, the various uh, relationships between genetic and genomic predictors and phenotypes. So with respect to each particular phenotype variable, um, there would have been uh, some uh, subgroups with respect to a response to perturbation of a driver, let's say a SNP. So that uh, a given SNP might actually drive expression in one, in one subgroup, but not another, or it might drive um, handedness of symptoms in one subgroup, but not the other. Uh, combining these different subgroups, we could see whether a given patient happened to be in a subgroup across different uh, phenotypes, which altogether would allow us to look at whether patients clustered into subgroups overall 
by a combination of phenotypes. And uh, we performed this clustering with bootstrapping to see whether or not there were stable groups emerging. In this case, there were groups emerging at above 80% frequency. And uh, first of all, as a reminder, we did this on, a, on less than one third of the original expression data because we were also looking at genetics to which we could um, attribute these subgroups, perhaps, we were hoping. And so, in fact, uh, we did find a close relationship to the result published uh, in the uh, Tavani et al. paper. So what you're seeing is patients on the y-axis, so vertically, and uh, different gene expression profiles on the x-axis. Gene expression clearly clusters into two phenotypes, and at the same time, the patients cluster into two phenotypes, and the colored bar on the left, the blue and the red bar, represents the patient clustering that was found in the Tobani paper. And you can see that that very closely matches the clusters that we have detected in the study. Okay. So these were the final models again. And let's talk about what we have uh, found by m mining the simulation results where we uh, knock down uh, certain gene expression profiles or flip SNPs between their homozygous minor and homozygous major states. So for the uh, SNP endpoint models without gene expression, just genetic drivers, uh, there was a handedness network that you can see on the left, a cerebellar pyramidal network, and a small brainstem network. Uh, and so the implicated pathways for these networks were NCAM signaling, um, which has been implicated in the mass, and PAS3 transcription in neurogenesis, which is in general uh, in neurogenesis and psychiatric disorders, and uh, the uh, K channel, KCNJ6. And we think that there may be some justification for this as well biologically. This, uh, so this hairball represents the SNP and RNA models. And out of that, we have extracted some uh, results that we thought were interesting. So these were the SNP drivers of blood gene expression, which has been interesting in the context of that study. And so for the SNP RNA models, the um, in looking, looking at the RNA, RNA interactions, we were able to uh, grab some patients who were excluded from the model because they didn't have either genetic data or clinical data or didn't pass some other QC metrics that had nothing to do with expression and see whether that relationship was significant in the held out data set, the one that didn't make it to the final model data frame. And over 90% of the interactions predicted in the SNP RNA model among different expression profiles was uh, significant in the out-of-sample data. Um, there was uh, some replication of other interactions, in particular genetics um, to handedness signal that we're actually looking at now. Um, although at uh, high Benferroni correction, it was not a very broad data set, which is not surprising because the genetics uh, data set was in the SNP RNA models was only 99 patients. And so um, in the SNP-only model, one SNP emerged as suggestive with a p-value of below 0.1 after Bonferroni correction. And again, that's in the NCAM signaling, and it uh, makes some biological sense. So this is uh, the basic uh, description of the models that we have built and the results we had in model one. As I said, we are doing some further work uh, to refine these models. Um, those results are unfortunately not yet ready for a broad discussion. And I'll take any questions um, in the Q&A window. Any questions?
I actually had a, a question with regarding to the hand in this model and the implications of uh, left brain versus right brain activity. Um, you know, implications for ac brain activity and any um, uh, MRI types of, of studies that have been done there. MRI. Yeah, so what's the question? So it's, it's basically that is there a differential activity? If you're looking at left brain versus right brain activity, is there an implication for the level of uh, synap synaptic transmission based on the way that a person functions? If they're, you know, left-handed, right-handed, left brain, right brain. Yeah. Understood. Okay, so this uh, actually the, the best answer to this comes from one of the follow-on models that we're trying to investigate in more depth. Uh, we found a very intriguing SNP that seems to affect the relationship between right and left-handedness rate of progression. Mm -hmm. um, that SNP actually occurs in a uh, gene that uh, is known to regulate handedness in the human right. population. Uh, which makes a lot of sense. Now, the question that we don't have the answer to right now is whether the gene regulates the handedness in the sense that, you know, if you happen to be left-handed, you will mainly lose left-handed function first, and right-handed, you'll mainly lose right-handed function. Let's say the dominant hand is going to be affected more every time. Or, you know, whether the SNP does something more interesting than that. We don't know that at this point. Thanks. Yep. Hi, Boris. This is Magali. Hi. So you you mentioned that uh, the imaging data uh, was not one of the final endpoints in the mo in the model that you found to be statistically significant, but obviously it was put at the front end to help constrain the model. Yes. And I'm, and I'm wondering. If you removed imaging variables from the model, would that give you more power to look at the SNP DNA relationships, um, as SNP RNA relationships, <laughs> or would it un in inadvertently reduce the uh, the constraints on the model because imaging has maybe some uh, mid mid middle uh, activity there that we're not observing. So I personally don't think this uh, data set benefits uh, from uh, the imaging data in terms of it being a constraint. It would have been more interesting as a phenotype, but it probably would have required a longer course of observation. I think the average course of observation under this study was probably on your uh, four years or so uh, for the imaging data set, maybe five. And uh, it just doesn't change enough in that time, except uh, lesion volume, which fluctuates a lot over that period. And so for a different reason, it also doesn't have a lot of predictive power. So uh, removing the imaging data and generating a larger sample size is one of the more important features of model two that we're looking at, actually, since we didn't get a lift from using it. That's exactly what we have done. And especially the genetic model becomes much larger. I think uh, with uh, the model with uh, RNA goes from 99 to about 160 patients. And the model with genetics only goes from 230 to about 600. Those are roughly the changes in sample sizes. And Boris, I don't know if you can see it, but we do have a question that came I, I do see it. I'm reading it uh, as we speak. OK. I see. So the question is why we didn't consider MRI causing gene expression changes. Um, that's a great question, and I actually do have an answer for that. Um, the problem is, uh, as I said, gene expression was collected um, at a time point that was, in some sense, random with respect to the time course of observation for um, most patients. It was a cross-sectional data collection, not longitudinal and not planned. So uh, we didn't have a way of relating uh, 
MRI of to that. And now let me just take a look at that diagram really quick, just to make sure that it w definitely was not included. Now, what should we share that slide? Yeah. So basically, our thinking was that um, it would be a um, situation where, for some patients, MRI happened too late to be causal, um, and for others, it didn't. And because MRI requires a number of years under observation to um, actually even show some signal, it would have been only a small sample of patients for whom MRI could have potentially been causal. So we probably would have confounded the model by adding the MRI to gene expression edge just because of the length of observation and the number of patients who actually showed um, significant variability in MRI. I hope that that's a sufficient answer. But yes, generally speaking, we would have wanted to include that edge as well. As I said, the MRI processing was uh, um, challenging in this case. And we were also worried that the MRI signal might potentially have uh, processing artifacts that we might not have noticed. And we were also concerned that we would introduce essentially confounders by giving MRI that type of um, signal. Generally speaking, I agree, MRI ought to be um, a driver. But the combination of time frame and uh, processing artifacts made us tread with caution. Any other questions? I have another question. So you uh, you did an out of sample analysis that corroborated some of the uh, findings, and I'm wondering what you think would need to be necessary to do full replication or validation of this model. What so kind first of? Well, I would probably focus on the findings from model two because I think uh, it's going to be enriched for the more interesting findings that are. Uh, in the domain of perhaps genetic variability. Um, and now what it would take is a study of a comparable size, a data, data set of comparable size and perhaps with some length of observation um, to validate that. We do have some out of sample patients who are out of sample by chance, but once we remove the MRI uh, data, as I mentioned, that's one of the biggest reasons why there is missingness. All of a sudden, our out-of-sample data set effectively goes away in the second generation of models. And so now we can no longer validate most relationships. We just don't have enough data. So we would be interested in a new cohort that ha of approximately 500, 600 patients that had expression data, uh, GWAS data, and clinical endpoints in a longitudinal study. Is that correct? That would be ideal, yes. Generally speaking, a rule of thumb for validation, in my opinion, is a data set of a similar or larger size, depending on what you're validating and what your original powering was. Thank you. Can you speak a little bit to the limitations of the REFS uh, engine, the actual algorithmic approach? Um, for example, uh, maybe you can comment on whether you use parametric or non-parametric approaches or uh, some of the uh, assumptions in the data frame uh, for this project where we assumed um, that SNPs drive everything but nothing drives SNPs. Uh, if you could just comment a little bit on what you see as the limitations of this modeling approach. Okay. Well, I'll start backwards. With respect to genetics driving everything, I think in multiple sclerosis it's a safe assumption to make. Uh, we have worked with a couple of multiple myeloma data sets, for instance. There, it may not be a safe assumption. In um, in, when in general, when you look at cancer and you have high mutability, you may not be uh, putting genetics as immutable drivers of variability at the top of the network. So this is a data set specific assumption rather than a platform constraint. Um, 
as far as uh, refs in the general causal modeling is considered, if you're going to do de novo causal modeling without making specific assumptions and without randomized trials and Fisher's sense, uh, what you have to do is consider so-called Markov equivalent structures. There are essentially what the networks can find unambiguously is independencies. So for instance, A does not relate to C directly, it requires B as an intermediary. But then there is a caveat that if you only look at A, B, and C, it can be A, B, C, or C, B, A. Both of those are considered Markov equivalent structures. However, when you happen to have some constraints on the network, such as uh, genetics or clinical data by experimental design having been effectively tiebreakers that are immutable given that can substantially orient the network and reduce the number of these Markov equivalent structures significantly. So um, it's a theoretical limitation on this type of causal inference um, that, uh, you know, to, to get proper directionalities, as opposed to independencies. It really helps to have these upstream drivers. Now, going back to parametric versus non-parametric, there is nothing in our approach itself that causes us to be parametric or non-parametric. In fact, our platform does have non-parametric um, inference capabilities built in. Um, however, parametric inference is far more appropriate for small data sets in particular, which this was definitely a kind of. And in addition, far more appropriate when the number of variables is far greater than the number of samples, um, because it's statistically more powered. Uh, performing non-parametric inference on these kinds of data sets um, is likely to yield nothing in most cases. Um, that's the key limitation of non-parametric inference in general, that if you're looking at multidimensional data where there are many inputs, um, even aside from causal inference, if you're looking at a multidimensional biomarker uh, for a data set with 100 variables, I'm sorry, 100 patients, and you're trying to create the biomarker for a phenotype, you're unlikely to find more than two predictors even if your signal is very, very strong using non-parametric inference. There are actually theoretical considerations where you can kind of guess at your upper limit, you know, how well you can do. But just believing that those are fairly strong limitations. So that's why we have chosen to do parametric inference in this particular study. But we have looked at the uh, at an MS data set of a similar size, but actually with less data, specifically less da fewer data types using both parametric and non-parametric inference. Yeah, so um, what I'm saying here about parametric inference being more appropriate is actually informed by practical experience. Did I answer all your questions? Or am I forgetting something? Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions from our audience? I think we're, okay, I, I think then um, I want to thank you, Boris, for uh, presenting today. You did a very nice job of presenting a very complex topic, and uh, we'll certainly be looking forward to hearing more from you about Model 2, and I thank the audience for your attention. Uh, so we will adjourn now with uh, our webinar series for Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magali. Thank you, Boris. This is Alden. Great presentation. Thank you. Bye.